The purpose of this video is to outline the variational method, which depends on something called the variational principle, which we'll derive in, in the process of talking about how the method's implemented in chemistry. So we spent our time so far this semester working through what we call analytical solutions to the Schrodinger equation. We define a Hamiltonian based on the chemical system of interest, and we can actually go through, usually with French mathematicians helping us, we can go through and solve the resulting differential equation. But it turns out that the electronic Schrodinger equation is not analytically soluble for any chemical system that's got more than one electron. This is referred to as the famous three-body problem, is that if you have uh, three bodies or more in any sort of system, you end up with differential equations that can't be solved exactly. So in light of this, we could take the approach of looks like quantum mechanics is not useful to chemistry because obviously we want to study things with more, more than one electron. We're obviously not going to follow that approach. The other approach is to use approximate methods. So rather than solving the equation exactly, we'll talk about how we can do it in an approximate method, in an approximate fashion, and often uh, that's going to be uh, good enough for our purposes, especially with modern computing power. And so the variational method is the main algorithm that is used by computers in the approximate solution of the Schrodinger equation. So we're going to learn how to do this um, ourselves. Uh, execute the variational method with pencil and paper, and then we're going to let computers uh, do the heavy lifting for us in the future. And so let's just start off thinking about the Schrodinger equation from a slightly different point of view. So if we consider the ground state of some system, and ground state means the lowest quantum number allowed for that state, so particle in a box that's n equals 1, for harmonic oscillator that's v equals 0, uh, corresponds to the lowest energy state for the system that has a wave function psi 0 associated with that and of course um, energy that goes along with that particular quantum number that satisfies the Schrodinger equation h psi 0 equals e psi 0. And so for a particle in a box, since we have derived the analytical expressions for the energy and for the wave function, we just plug in n equals 1, the lowest energy state possible for a particle in a box, and we can easily write down what the ground state energy and the ground state wave function look like for this particular case. Now let's think about a problem um, that we don't have an analytical solution for and how we would go about approaching this. So we don't have the solution to the Schrodinger equation for the problem that, that we're interested in, but we assume that there is a solution out there. It's just that we don't have the mathematical methods to at least easily get to that solution. But the solutions exist because the system actually exists. And so we take that equation and we multiply on the left-hand side by psi zero star uh, both sides of the equation, and then we integrate over the appropriate coordinates, and so here I'm indicating the tau coordinate meeting whatever the appropriate coordinates are for uh, for the system of interest, we integrate over all of those those coordinates. And then we just solve this equation for the ground state energy. So just doing some algebra at this point, we can pull the energy out in front of the integral on the right-hand side, and we find that the energy for the ground state is just a fraction, and the numerator is uh, evaluating the Hamiltonian operator, uh, acting on the wave function times a complex conjugate integrated overall space, and the denominator is just the integral of the function. Um, basically, that's, of course, the, the normality definition in the, in the denominator. And so if we had normalized wave functions, the denominator would be equal to 1. But as we'll see in the variational method, um, we don't actually want to, and we actually cannot, pre-normalize the wave functions. And so we need to have a way of automatically normalizing them in the calculation of energy. And so again, just to emphasize that the integration here, we have to pay attention to what problem are we interested in solving. And so if we're doing particle in a box, we're integrating over x. If we're doing uh, h atom problem, we're integrating over the polar spherical polar coordinates are theta and phi. Okay, so we can obviously then calculate what the ground state energy is if we know what the Hamiltonian is. And so that's not going to be a problem, is that we can we can fairly easily write down Hamiltonians for multi-electron systems. The problem is that we can't solve the Schrodinger equation exactly. But if we have a good guess for what the wave function looks like for this new system, then we can um, approach it in a different way than we've done before. So we make an educated guess at the form of the wave function. This is called the trial wave function represented by the function phi. And this function has one or more adjustable parameters. And so the function might be an exponential function, but we put, for example, a uh, constant in front of the argument in the exponential that we can adjust to make the function a little bit different. 
and the idea here is that we just adjust the parameters uh, in that trial function so that it's better, a better approximation of what the actual wave function solution is. And the, the actual wave function solution, of course, is psi zero. If we, of course, get closer to the actual wave function, psi zero, then the energy we're calculating, E phi, will get really close to the actual energy, E zero. And usually, of course, it's the energy that we're interested in, in approximating because we can connect that more readily to experimental observables than the wave function itself. So the question is, how do we systematically improve the wave function? Sounds kind of like magic at this point. We guess at the wave function, we put a parameter in, and we improve it, but how do we, how do we actually improve it in a systematic way? This is where uh, the variational principle comes in, or the variational theorem comes in. And so we need to derive this to see how uh, this actually leads to a pretty uh, handy uh, algorithm that is not so hard for students to execute with pencil and paper, but is actually really, really computationally efficient for computers to do. So again, we, we, we don't know the solution to the Schrodinger equation, but we assume that they exist, and we're going to write down the Schrodinger equation now in a more general form where we're indicating that, of course, there are multiple solutions, multiple wave functions, multiple energies, just like in the systems for which we have solved the Schrodinger equation exactly. And what we're going to do here is, is, is sort of the reverse of, of an idea we've talked about before, and this is that we're going to guess with a trial function at the solution, and we're going to take advantage of the idea in the general idea in mathematics is that any function in mathematics can be represented by a series of other functions added together. And so what we're going to say here is that the trial function that we guess is actually made up of a sum of the actual wave functions that are solutions to the problem. Okay, and so that's why we define our Schrodinger equation in a way that we're thinking about all the possible solutions to the problem. So to think about something concrete, say that we're attempting to solve the Schrodinger equation for the helium atom. We would then, of course, use as uh, the set of functions that we're adding together uh, that represents our trial function, the 1s orbital for helium, the 2s orbital, the 2p orbital, and so on. So just to put a concrete idea behind this idea of representing the function as a sum of other functions. And so the next step in the variational method is then to calculate the energy. So we go back to our expression where we have a numerator and a denominator to, uh, uh, to actually deal with. And so here we're indicating that we're replacing the trial function with the sum of the functions that actually are solutions to the Schrodinger equation for this problem times some coefficient ci. Okay, and so just plugging in directly, um, we get something that looks rather messy to begin with. Um, but then what we can do, of course, is that the Hamiltonian operator acting on the functions that are actually solutions to the problem, so this is basically just an eigenvalue equation situation, is when we act on a, when we have h act on psi j, then we're going to return the energy for the jth state of the system and, of course, the wave function back again. And so you can see that's what's been done here on uh, on the term where h is multiplying this term that we have the energy now showing up uh, inside that expression. We return the wave function psi j. And then we're doing um, absolutely nothing to the rest of, of this thing. But what we can do then is we can group terms that, of course, um, are not going to be affected by the integration that's indicated both in the numerator and the denominator. So we can pull the coefficients, we can pull the energies, we can pull those all out in front of the integrals, uh, both in the numerator and the denominator. <clears throat> and then what's left behind inside the integrals in both the numerator and the denominator is what should look like um, uh, an integral that we have thought about before in general. And so basically this integral reminds us to think about the orthonormality of the wave functions. And so if i and j are the same function, that would be the definition of normality that if we've normalized these functions, that integral should be equal to 1. If these functions are different from each other, then this integral is automatically equal to 0. And we've represented that by this thing called the Kronecker delta function. So if i equals j, this integral is 1. If i is not equal to j, this integral equals 0. And so what this says is that our energy expression, which looks kind of complicated, that it's only non-zero when i is equal to j. And so that leads to this dramatically more simple expression where the numerator is really just the sum over i 
of the complex conjugate of the coefficient ci times the coefficient ci times the energy ei divided by again the sum over um, the that same uh, product of, of of the imaginary and the real component of the of the coefficient now we subtract e0 the true ground state energy from both sides of the equation so we're just doing things algebraic algebraically here as so we don't know what e0 is we're just setting up an expression that we can work with and so Having done that here, we can see that um, E0 is just simply being represented by the exact same fraction that we saw before, just multiplying by the same coefficients, the numerator and the denominator. And what that lets us do, of course, is group terms uh, on the right-hand side of the equation here. We have EI minus E0 multiplying by um, the square of the coefficients. And so the uh, straight lines here uh, indicate that we're taking the modulus, which means we're, we're taking the, the real square of the coefficients, um, ci, and then we have this, the same term here in the denominator. Because the square of ci um, is the sum of positive real numbers, so this is positive and this is positive, and E0 is defined to be the lowest energy state, that means that whatever EI is, it's larger than E0, then the difference between the two must also be a positive number. And so we can identify this term's positive, this term's positive, this term's positive. And then that means that E phi, the energy we're calculating with our approximate method, is guaranteed to be higher energy than the true ground state energy. And so down here we have that conclusion that whatever guess we make at a trial wave function for our system of interest will always have energy that's higher than the true ground state energy. So this fact that whatever uh, trial wave function we guess will lead to an energy higher than the ground state energy is referred to as the variational principle. And so why is this a useful thing? Well, it just means that will always be higher in our guess from the true ground state energy. And what that lets us do is it says that if we were to go back now and adjust, for example, our parameter and our wave function to try to make it better, is that we'll know that we made it better if we uh, lower the energy in that adjustment. If we make an adjustment the energy goes up, we know we got further away from the true answer. But again, an adjustment that leads to a lowering of energy means that we're getting closer to the answer. So if we can come up with an algorithm that automatically adjusts our variational parameter, it's called, um, then we can get closer and closer to the actual um, energy and the actual wave function for the system that we're, we're interested in. So how do we automate this? Well, let's assume that our trial wave function uh, phi has an adjustable parameter alpha, then the energy is a function of this parameter, right? So if, if we put an alpha term, say, in the argument of the exponential of our exponential function guess at the trial function, then that would be our adjustable parameter. Since the variational principle says that the best answer, the most true answer, is when the energy is at a minimum, then all we have to do is find the minimum in this function, E of alpha. And so we set the derivative of that energy expression with respect to alpha, set that equal to zero, and then solve for the value of alpha that minimizes E. So this is how we automate the process. Calculus tells us that all we have to do is minimize that function, and that will automatically lead to the value of alpha that leads to the closest approximation for the trial wave function to the true ground state wave function. So how do we go about picking trial wave functions? Well, the variational method will be most accurate when we pick trial wave functions that are close to the actual wave function. So we have to be smart about this, in other words. That's why we study the quantum systems for which we have exact solutions is to learn about what these systems look like, uh, what kinds of different functions result in quantum mechanics, and then we can make smart guesses for systems that are, are similar or systems that are different. So for example, if we want to solve the electronic Schrodinger equation for the helium atom, we probably want to guess trial wave functions that look like the hydrogen atom, and not pick trial wave functions that look like the harmonic oscillator, for example, because the hydrogen atom system is much closer to the helium atom system. So this isn't so hard, but we, 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 we do need to think about the systems for which we have exact solutions and see whether we can uh, adapt those for this purpose. 
And then the variational method will also be most efficient when we pick trial functions, uh, trial wave functions that make evaluating the energy easy, because we have to do that over and over again each time we adjust um, alpha. And so we'll see in the actual implementation of the variational method on computers that actually these two aspects are sort of balanced, is that we don't actually pick the very best wave function because it could be harder to actually evaluate the energy expression. And by the same token, though, we don't pick a nice simple function just because it's easy to evaluate the energy expression, is that that, that simple function might be simply too far away from the trial solution to ever get very close. So we'll take into account both of these ideas when we apply the variational method to systems of interest.